I'm handing out a text for um, Professor Sachs's talk, and he's going to begin in a second, but please take one, pass it around. There should be enough for all of us. So as Nancy's uh, sending around the handouts, I just want to begin by thanking Nancy and Rebecca uh, for putting on this fantastic symposium and for the invitation to participate. It's really a, a pleasure to be here. Um, and as the handouts go out, um, let me try to situate my talk this afternoon against the backdrop of Yael's talk earlier today, because we're both interested in the same set of questions. We're both interested in Mendelssohn and aesthetics and what this tells us about this rich environment of Berlin and the time that matters to us here. Um, and I really want to actually have my talk pick up with the last question that was posed to Yael earlier today. Uh, this morning Yael spoke persuasively about how for Mendelssohn uh, aesthetics can help prove the primacy of Judaism, uh, that how for Mendelssohn aesthetics can provide a common ground between Jews and Christians. And then the last question that was asked today after her talk was, what happens to Christianity in Mendelssohn's vision? If aesthetics show what Judaism has to offer, and if aesthetics in fact point to some kind of common ground between Jews and Christians, where is Christianity left in Mendelssohn's thoughts? And that's the issue I want to think about in my paper. And I want to argue that Mendelssohn develops what we might call an aesthetic critique of Christianity. Mendelssohn develops a critique of Christianity that revolves around that tradition's posture towards poetry and music associated with the Bible. Mendelssohn suggests implicitly, he never makes this explicit, and we can talk maybe about why he doesn't make it more explicit, but implicitly Mendelssohn suggests that theological and ethical problems plague Christianity because it neglects the substantive content of biblical poetry and because it neglects the musical recitation of the biblical text. Right, to kind of put it very crudely for Mendelssohn, if Christianity did poetry and music more effectively, it would produce better theology and better people. I'll begin by talking a bit about uh, how Mendelssohn treats biblical poetry in his German writings, in particular in his uh, classic work, Jerusalem. I'll then talk a bit about how Mendelssohn treats music in his Hebrew writings, and I'll conclude by thinking about what we learn from this analysis. Um, and I'll try to complicate, maybe, some of the picture that we've heard earlier today. We've heard a picture of um, aesthetics in Enlightenment Berlin as providing a source of religious unity, as providing common ground. I think that's true, but I think there's another dimension as well. I think aesthetics in Enlightenment Germany um, aren't just a basis for religious unity, they're also a basis for religious critique. Uh, but before I get to that, let me offer two words of background on Mendelssohn. Uh, so Mendelssohn is a universalist, and he's a universalist in two ways that matter for us. First, he's a universalist with respect to religious knowledge. So for Mendelssohn, core religious truths core principles, uh, God's existence, God's providence, the soul's immortality. These truths are accessible to all individuals merely on the basis of rational reflection. And according to Mendelssohn, there are no indispensable eternal truths, no religious principles crucial for salvation that are accessible only by means of revelation. And as some of you may know, Mendelssohn repeatedly presents us as a point on which Judaism and Christianity differ can leave aside for a moment the question of whether Mendelssohn gets Christianity right. But for better or for worse, Mendelssohn thinks that Judaism affirms the idea that core religious truths are accessible to all individuals. Whereas according to Mendelssohn, Christianity thinks there are principles that are indispensable for salvation, but are only accessible by direct divine revelation. Christ's divinity, for example. Christ's messianic status. These aren't principles we can know through reason. They're only principles we can know through revelation. This is one way in which Mendelssohn's a universalist. He's a universalist with respect to religious knowledge, but he's also a universalist with respect to anthropology. Mendelssohn posits a universal human vocation or task. For Mendelssohn, the vocation or task of the human being is the pursuit of perfection. This is a condition ultimately unobtainable in which an individual has properly cultivated and rendered harmonious the various faculties of her body and soul. 
Now for Mendelssohn, the pursuit of perfection is an ethical imperative. Our basic ethical obligation is to promote our own perfection and the perfection of others. And an action is going to be good insofar as it promotes and impedes that cultivation. So business pursuits, for example, are good if we treat them as opportunities to cultivate skills, but evil if they distract from self-cultivation. And Mendelssohn thinks that self-perfection isn't just an ethical imperative, it's a theological imperative. God wants for us to pursue perfection. If God is omniscient, God will recognize perfection as our proper task, and if God is benevolent, God will want for us to pursue that proper task. And for Mendelssohn, this means that religious reflection, recurring reflection on God, is going to be ethically significant. If I reflect again and again on God, I'll recognize that God wants for me to pursue perfection, and I'll therefore be motivated to ask whether my behavior meets that standard be motivated to act, engage in recurring ethical reflection. And this recurring ethical reflection will itself be efficacious. Um, if I reflect again and again on ethical questions, the judgments emerging from that reflection are going to become so ingrained that they become almost instinctual. I'll develop instincts for the good, inclinations and passions for actions that promote perfection. I'll become disposed to act in ways that promote perfection that are good. So Mendelssohn is a universalist with respect to uh, knowledge, and he's a universalist with respect to uh, this task of pursuing perfection. So we'll keep these ideas in mind as we look at what Mendelssohn has to say about aesthetics. I want to begin by talking about poetry. Uh, so as uh, was mentioned earlier today, um, biblical poetry, in particular the Psalms, are really for Mendelssohn um, often cast as crucial to creating an inclusive society. They're often cast by Mendelssohn as a source of religious unity. So Yael gave us that beautiful passage from Mendelssohn's final extant letter where he writes to a Christian correspondent that the Psalms are a source of true edification for every enlightened person. Uh, and we also talked about how Mendelssohn in 1783 publishes the Psalms translation for Jewish and non-Jewish readers. And he explicitly casts this translation as an attempt to create religious common ground. He casts this translation as an attempt to overcome messianic readings that both Jews and Christians give to the Psalms. So all of this is true. Mendelssohn does see the Psalms as a source of religious unity, but he doesn't just see the Psalms as a source of religious unity. And if we look at what he actually says about specific Psalms, and how he actually deploys the Psalms in the very years he's publishing this translation, he again and again presents the Psalms as offering a particularly sharp rebuke to Christianity. Again and again, Mendelssohn suggests that the Psalms undermine key doctrines that he takes to be associated with Christianity. So look, for example, at what he says in Jerusalem, in his classic German defense of Judaism, appearing in 1783, the very year he publishes his Psalm translation. This is the first passage on your handout. A venerable friend with whom I once conversed on religious matters put the question to me of whether I would not wish to be assured by a direct revelation that I would not be miserable in the future. We both agreed that I did not have to fear eternal punishment in hell, for God cannot let any of his creatures suffer unceasing misery. That the punishment for sin must be proportionate to the offended majesty of God and therefore infinite, this hypothesis my friend had, long ago, uh, had given up long ago, as many great men of his church had likewise done. This being assumed, my friend's question became more, precisely defined, or became more precisely defined whether I must not wish to be assured by a revelation that in the future life I should be exempt even from finite misery. No, I answered, this misery can be nothing other than a well-deserved chastisement. And in God's paternal household, I shall gladly suffer the chastisement I deserve. God's justice, that is his all-wise love, seeks to guide me to moral improvement by means of physical misery. So Mendelssohn imagines here a conversation with a friend of his who represents a strand of thinking within the church. This friend represents a stream of thinking within 18th century Christianity that's rejected the idea of eternal punishment in hell, but holds on to the idea that believers might be exempt from, even from finite misery in a future life. This seems to be a version of Christianity that affirms that believers are immediately forgiven of sins and taken into heaven. Again, we'll leave aside the question of whether Mendelssohn is getting Christianity right here. He thinks that this is a view associated with Christianity. And Mendelssohn in this passage rejects this view on rational grounds. He says this view just doesn't make sense. Finite punishment in a future life is God's way of acting justly and leading to moral improvement. Uh, God, finite punishment in a future life, Mendelssohn says, is just God's way of giving people what they deserve, giving people their due, and eliciting repentance. Therefore, it's not going to be the kind of thing from which God exempts anyone. It's beneficial. 
Mendelssohn is saying that this doctrine he associates with Christianity doesn't make sense. But he doesn't think it's untenable just on rational grounds. He thinks it's untenable on biblical grounds and on poetic grounds. Look at what he says in the very next lines from Jerusalem. This is the next passage on your handouts. Can I wish that my father withdraw his chastising hand from me before it has had the effect it was meant to produce? If I request that God let a transgression of mine go entirely unpunished, do I know what I'm requesting? Oh, surely this too is a quality of God's infinite love, that he allows no transgression of man to go entirely unpunished. Surely all power is God's alone, and love also is thine, O Lord, when thou renderest to everyone according to his deeds. Psalm 62. Mendelssohn repeats his rational rejection of this view he associates with Christianity. He again says that finite punishment, punishment is actually an expression of divine love, it's beneficial. And then he says that the Psalms agree with him. Psalm 62, according to Mendelssohn, says that God's love is manifest when thou renderest to everyone according to his deeds. Divine love, according to the Psalms, says Mendelssohn, uh, it requires that God administer rather than withhold punishments. Mendelssohn is here identifying a doctrine with Christianity, and he's saying that it's untenable, not just on rational grounds, but on biblical grounds. This is not an isolated move in Mendelssohn's thought. He makes this move again and again. If we had more time, we'd look at many of these moves. I just want to look at one other move from Jerusalem. In the very next pages, he makes a similar move. Uh, so remember earlier that I said that for Mendelssohn, um, Judaism affirms the universal accessibility of core religious truths, whereas Christianity says that there are some truths accessible only by means of revelation. Now, Mendelssohn thinks that that Christian posture, again, is untenable on purely rational grounds. It wouldn't make sense for God to make indispensable truths accessible only by means of revelation. Revelation is always given in a particular language to a particular community at a particular point in time, and thus not the sort of thing that can be universally intelligible. But again, Mendelssohn doesn't just think this posture that he associates with Christianity is untenable rationally. He again thinks it's untenable biblically, and in particular, poetically. So look at what he says in the very next lines of Jerusalem. This is the next passage. Religious doctrines and propositions or eternal truths about God and his government and providence, that which man cannot be enlightened and happy, did not have to be given by direct revelation or made known through word and script. For this reason our much quoted poet sings, the heavens declare the majesty of God, and the firmament announceth the work of his hands. From one day this doctrine floweth into another, and night giveth instruction to night, no teaching no words without their voice being heard. Their uh, choral resoundeth over all the earth, their message goeth forth to the ends of the earth. Psalm 19. Mendelssohn repeats his rejection of the position he associates with Christianity. He repeats his rejection of the idea that there are indispensable truths given only through revelation. And then he again says the Psalms agrees with him. Psalm 19 presents, according to Mendelssohn, uh, knowledge of God as being manifest over all the earth without teaching and without words. Psalm 19 also rejects, according to Mendelssohn, the idea that verbal revelation is necessary. And it's not just Psalm 19, it's Psalm 113 as well. Look how Mendelssohn continues in the very next lines. He again refers to these indispensable eternal truths, and he says their effect is as universal as the beneficent influence of the sun, which as it hurries through its orbit sheds light and warmth over the whole globe. As the same poet explains still more clearly in another place, from sunrise to sundown, the name of the eternal is praised. Psalm 113. Again, the Psalms are cited as undermining a doctrine Mendelssohn associates with Christianity. Psalm 113 says that praise of God, knowledge of God, goes from sunrise to sundown. Mendelssohn reads this as a reference to the universal accessibility of core religious truths. Once again, Mendelssohn has identified a doctrine with Christianity and says both reason and biblical poetry reject it. Again, if we had more time, we could look at other examples, but I think the basic pattern that we find in Mendelssohn is clear. On the one hand, he does present the Psalms as a source of religious unity, as a source of truths that might transcend confessional boundaries, but when it comes time for him to actually talk about particular Psalms at this point in his life, at the same time he's publishing a translation of the Psalms for non-Jews, he again and again suggests that the Psalms undermine key claims associated with Christianity. Right, he seems to be saying here that Christianity can only affirm certain views regarding divine punishment, regarding religious knowledge, if it neglects both reason and biblical poetry. This is an aesthetic critique of Christianity. 
Christianity, according to Mendelssohn, remains mired in flawed theological doctrines because it neglects the substantive content of biblical poetry. And poetry isn't the only area where Mendelssohn makes this kind of aesthetic critique of Christianity. He makes it has a similar critique to offer, I think, with respect to an issue that Yael talked about this morning, uh, the accents, the cantillation signs, the system that governs the musical recitation of the Bible in Jewish liturgical contexts. Um, Mendelssohn is writing uh, at, during the emergence of what we now call biblical criticism, and he knows that biblical critics of his era have very little positive to say about this system, about the system that governs how the Bible is chanted or sung in Jewish worship. He knows that most biblical critics of his era, of, of his era see the accents um, as a post-biblical innovation, largely invented by the Masoretes by 8th to 10th century editors, with no real connection to the biblical text. And Mendelssohn talks about this again and again. So, for example, in the introduction to his Biur, in the introduction to that Hebrew commentary on the Pentateuch, he writes about how Christian scholars and Christian translators do not accept the accents that we Jews possess. And interestingly, Mendelssohn doesn't ascribe this rejection of the accents to the scholarly commitments of those biblical critics. He doesn't say it's their scholarly methodology that leads them to reject the accents. He says it's their religious background. In that same text, in the introduction to the beer, he says, um, I do not condemn these Christian scholars for this, for rejecting the accents, for what compels them to heed the tradition that they have not received from their ancestors seems to be saying that it's natural for Christian biblical critics to reject this musical system uh, because they were raised in a tradition that makes a similar move, because these accents are, are, are part of a tradition that they have not received from their ancestors, um, because these accents are grounded in Jewish textual and liturgical practices, not in Christian worship and study. Now, on the one hand, this is a kind of charitable move for Mendelssohn to make. He's saying it's understandable excuse me, that um, Christian biblical critics are just reproducing the attitude with which they were raised. Uh, but he goes on to suggest that that underlying attitude itself, that underlying Christian neglect of this musical system, is itself a problem. Look at the these parts of this passage from Yael's talk this morning. This is also from the same text I've just been quoting, from the introduction to uh, the Beor. Moses, our master, peace be upon him, heard all the Torah's words from the mouth of the Almighty with every type of beauty and with the vocalizations and the accents. And people would teach the words to their children and their students in this way, for this is the commandment and you shall teach them to your children, namely that the words shall be ever ready in one's mouth. They would not give the Holy Scripture to their sons or students, leaving them to read it in written form alone. Rather, teachers would recite it before their students and repeat it with their students, with the sound of the words and with pleasantness in singing. They would thereby pass along the accents of the Torah and sweeten speech with honey, until the words would enter their hearts and be present there, like goads and nails that have been planted. So Yael this morning pointed out that one reason the accents matter for Mendelssohn is exegetical. They illuminate the meaning of the biblical text. Um, and I think there's an additional reason the accents matter for Mendelssohn as well. He says here that reciting the Bible with this system neglected by Christianity, reciting the Bible with pleasantness of singing, with the accents, ensures that the Bible's words enter listeners' hearts and are present there like goads and nails that have been planted seems to be suggesting that uh, singing the Bible, reciting the Bible with music, somehow firmly implants the Bible's words in the minds and hearts of listeners. Mendelssohn is referring here, I think, to a phenomenon familiar to any of us who've ever had a song lyric stuck in our head. Sung words, kind of musically chanted words, remain more firmly lodged in our memory than spoken words. And Mendelssohn says, and here he's borrowing language from a rabbinic text, Mendelssohn says that these Mem- these sung words that are memorized become in Hebrew mechudadim, meaning ever ready or finely honed or well discussed. Um, if these sung words become lodged in our memories, become lodged in our hearts, they're going to become objects of recurring reflection. We're going to find ourselves thinking about them again and again. So what Mendelssohn seems to be saying here is that this musical system that he takes Christianity to neglect transforms the Bible's words into objects of recurring reflection. Because these words are sung, they are firmly lodged in our minds, and we find ourselves thinking about them again and again. The question we immediately want to ask is, what's at stake here? 
Why does that matter? What has Christianity lost for Mendelssohn because it neglects this system that transforms the Bible's words into objects of recurring reflection? Mendelssohn doesn't answer that question in this passage, but he does get at this issue later in the viewer in another passage that Yael brought for us this morning in the, uh, Mendelssohn's commentary on Exodus 15. He's concerned there with biblical poetry, but as you heard from Yael, music is very much on his mind. And in fact, he raises the very same issue we just saw him raise in the viewer's introduction, this question of what happens when the Bible's words become objects of recurring reflection. This is what Mendelssohn has to say. This is the next passage on your handouts. The end desired in biblical poetry is that the words enter not only the listener's ear, but also his heart. They should remain engraved on the tablets of his heart, firmly establishing within him the virtues and excellent dispositions. So that the poem's words might serve this end, our ancestors would cut every utterance uh, into parts and divide each part into short clauses, nearly equal in their quantity. This practice aids memory, since when a short clause contains content and meaning that enter the heart, this content easily becomes orally preserved, memorized, and enduringly familiar. So Mendelssohn says that there's something about biblical poetry which means that the Bible's words become memorized and enduringly familiar. Biblical poetry serves the same function as biblical music. It lodges the Bible's words firmly in our memory, and it renders them enduringly familiar, transforms themselves into the kinds of things we think about again and again. Unless we miss the connection with biblical music, Mendelssohn uses almost identical language here. When he talked about the cantillation signs, he talked about words entering hearts and being present there. And when he talks about biblical poetry, he again in the same Hebrew talks about words entering not only the listener's ear, but also his heart. Uh, Mendelssohn seems to be referring here to uh, that structure that Yael referred to earlier today, um, whereby biblical poetry is divided into short parallel clauses. Um, Mendelssohn says that biblical poetry cuts every utterance into parts and divides each part into short clauses, and this practice aids memory. The idea here is that biblical poetry involves these short parallel phrases that will stick in our minds. So just to give you one example, uh, Exodus 15:11, famously uh, in Mendelssohn's translation describes God as awesome in praise and doer of wonders. Uh, and on Mendelssohn's reading, uh, the Hebrew here consists of two short parallel clauses of two words each that will remain lodged in our mind. So God is described here as awesome in praise, doer of wonders. And Mendelssohn seems to think this is the kind of phrase that will stick in our mind and will reflect on it. So Mendelssohn is talking here about poetry, but he's saying that poetry serves the same function as biblical music. And he now gives us an account of why this matters so much what we gain from having the Bible's words become objects of recurring reflection. Um, Mendelssohn says that uh, what happens here is that because biblical poetry is structured in this way, it establishes within the listener virtues and excellent dispositions. Because poetry transforms the Bible's words into objects of recurring reflection, um, it cultivates virtuous dispositions, dispositions to do good, dispositions to act in ways that promote perfection. And I think we can understand what Mendelssohn means here if we think back to his claim about that vocation of pursuing perfection. So remember that Mendelssohn said that um, uh, God is the kind of being who wants for us to pursue perfection. And then this means that frequent reflection on God is going to have an ethical impact. We're going to reflect on God again and again. We'll realize that God wants for us to pursue perfection. We'll be motivated to assess our actions. And this recurring ethical reflection will generate instincts for the good. Our judgments will become so ingrained that they cultivate inclinations for the good. Well, if we link this to what Mendelssohn says about biblical poetry, we get the conclusion here. If biblical poetry transforms the Bible's words into objects of recurring reflection, and if the Bible's words include claims about God, then biblical poetry generates recurring reflection on God, and according to Mendelssohn, this will have an ethical impact. We're gonna hear this phrase, awesome and praise, doer of wonders. It's gonna be lodged in our mind. We're gonna think about it again and again. This recurring reflection on the God will produce in us virtuous dispositions. We'll ask whether our behavior meets God's standards. Uh, the judgments emerging will become uh, so deeply ingrained that they become instincts and will acquire dispositions for the good. Right, recurring reflection on God produces virtue. Uh, recurring reflection on the Bible's words produces virtuous individuals. Well, I think we can now see what's at stake when Mendelssohn says that Christianity neglects the musical system employed in Jewish liturgical contexts. 
Mendelssohn says that Christianity neglects a system that transforms the Bible's words into objects of recurring reflection. And then later in the Bure, in almost the same language, he says that that kind of recurring reflection on the Bible's words is ethically significant. So what Mendelssohn is saying here is that when Christianity neglects the musical system that governs the Bible's uh, liturgical recitation, um, Christianity is neglecting an ethically vital pedagogic resource. Christianity is neglecting a tool that transforms the Bible's words into objects of recurring reflection, generates recurring reflection on God, and cultivates ethical dispositions in listeners. Right? Once again, we have an aesthetic critique of Christianity. Earlier, Mendelssohn said that Christianity remains mired in flawed doctrines because it neglects the substantive content of biblical poetry. Here he's saying that Christianity loses out on an ethically vital pedagogic resource because it neglects the musical recitation of the text. And as I said earlier, kind of very crudely for Mendelssohn, Christianity would produce better doctrine and better individuals if it cared more about biblical poetry and the Bible's musical recitation. Um, let me just conclude, I realize I'm out of time. Let me conclude by saying something about why this matters, about what we learn from this, about the issue that matters to us here today, kind of enlightenment Berlin. Um, so I mentioned earlier that Mendelssohn is often presented as taking aesthetics to be a source of common ground between Jews and Christians. And we've heard again and again that in uh, Sarah Levy's house, for example, uh, music provided a common meeting ground between Jews and Christians. I think this is right, but I think the passages I've explored here highlight an additional dimension of Enlightenment Berlin. For Mendelssohn, aesthetics are a source of uh, common ground for Jews and Christians, but they're also a particularly serious threat to Christianity. When Mendelssohn publishes tr his translation of the Psalms, he's not just making available a shared source of religious truth, he's publishing a book that in his mind undermines key Christian doctrine. When he talks about the biblical accents, he's not just talking about something that Judaism possesses, he's talking about something that he thinks Christianity lacks. And so for Mendelssohn, aesthetic claims aren't just a source of religious unity, they're also a basis of religious critique. Aesthetic claims aren't just a way for bridges to be built between traditions, they're also a way to underscore just how different those traditions can be. Thank you. We've got a few Okay, 10 minutes for questions. Excellent. Dig it. 10 minutes it is. Okay, yes, please. Um, just related to your talk um, about having the words in songs so they're ingrained in your heart and they're, you're more likely to think about them. I think that encourages questioning um, the relevance of the words and the ethics with the, t with the time. So the religion can adapt you know, it's not just I'm going to constantly think about these commandments and be a perfect person, but I can reinterpret the commandments because I'm constantly thinking about them. And as you know, 100 years pass, technology passes, I can think about them in new ways. Whereas maybe if you're waiting for a revelation, there's one answer, and since you're not, it's not part of you all the time, it doesn't adapt. You know, I could see that today with people um, against evolution and against teaching science and, you know, it's all about revelation as opposed to being a part of you or growth with you hundred years past, the change interpretation changes. So, uh, um, let, me, let me say that I think basically you're right in your reading of Mendelssohn. So I think that... Whatever he said. Yeah, well, so, you know, you'll notice the interesting thing here is I presented Mendelssohn as engaged in reflection on a God who's concerned with self-perfection, and this then cultivates frequent ethical reflection. Um, and I said that that's somehow linked to the Bible. Of course that's not in the Bible. Of course the Bible never says that the task of the human being is to pursue perfection. This is an idea Mendelssohn gets from 18th century German philosophy, from the thinkers Leibniz and Christian Wolff. So um, even what Mendelssohn is doing here is on some level saying that the Bible is going to be read in light of the best philosophy available in this context. And I think that's a theme that shows up again and again in Mendelssohn's thought. Again and again, he wants to say, for better or for worse, that Judaism is a tradition that cultivates a certain kind of reimagining of religious content. He thinks, for example, that's part of the goal of Jewish law. 
part of the goal of Jewish law is to direct attention to religious truths without form formulating them in any creedal um, statements. He thinks that's going to allow for a kind of conceptual flexibility over time. And so I think you're right to say that that's an element of Mendelssohn's thought, and that that might be part of what's going on here. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, Thanks for these questions. I would say that Lessing is very clearly critiquing Christianity, but my point is that it is not only Christianity that he is critiquing here. And the point of reading three texts together is to show a parallel structure in his thought processes where it very clearly is not just Christianity that is at stake in, in uh, in his aims, in what he's trying to do in these texts. So, yes, it is a critique of Christianity as it is presently practiced for Lessing, but not only that. So, um, let me say something about the audience of the viewer, and just because you raised the issue of audience, let me just connect it briefly back to also the audience of uh, Jerusalem. Um, so, there are at least two different Jewish groups that Mendelssohn is addressing in a Hebrew text such as the Beor. There are his more traditionalist readers, largely members of some sort of rabbinic intellectual elite who can understand the Hebrew itself. And then there are muscular. There are uh, figures associated with the Jewish Enlightenment. And I think that this kind of argument he presents here is going to function in different ways for those two groups, at least for the readers in those two groups who pick up on what he's doing here. Um, for the Maskeelim, they're the ones who, at least some of them, are beginning to know something about this biblical criticism, but they're knowing much more about Christianity. And they're beginning to know much more about how different, say, Christian worship looks from Jewish worship. We don't have kind of real serious liturgical reform yet, but this is a group that's beginning to understand um, what biblical criticism might mean for Judaism and um, how differently Christians think about these issues. And so for that group, I think the critique of Christianity you mentioned is quite important. There's also a, a kind of rabbinic intellectual elite that's reading this text, and I think part of what Mendelssohn is doing there is trying to introduce them to the possibility of a philosophically sophisticated analysis of these aesthetic issues. That is to say, part of what he wants to the case, if part of the case he's making to the Musculum is that Judaism has some as a serious response to European thought, part of the case he's making to some of his other readers is that European thought has a lot to offer to Jews. And by making this argument here about virtue um, that seems to be drawing on this more philosophical language, I think he's implicitly making the case that actually that kind of philosophical terminology, and that project of philosophy, has a lot to offer for an understanding of why Judaism is so valuable. Yes. Yeah, um, I was just wondering, uh, 
second thing to that too. I'm very curious about uh, Kierenberger, if you may know, set some of the Mendelssohn translations of the Bible to music, and wonder how, how this fits into everything. That could be quite an interesting topic for a paper if no one knows the answer to this question. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to? So maybe I'll, I'll take the Mendelssohn question and then we'll think more generally about have we turned Sarah Levy into this philosopher, musician. Um, so, um, you're right to see a gap, I think, between some of those 19th century thinker figures you describe and Mendelssohn. And that's because, although Mendelssohn is often see, uh, Mendelssohn is a precursor for those thinkers in some way, he's actually a very different figure and I think holds radically different views on a whole set of issues. Um, Mendelssohn is in some ways um, the first encounter between pre-modern Jewish thoughts and modern European thought. And so some of the issues that, um, I wouldn't want to say they've been resolved by that point, but some of the um, some of the moves that are in the air at that point are not yet in the air at Mendelssohn's point, or actually rejected by Mendelssohn. So Mendelssohn, for example, um, really wants to affirm that the Bible, in the form we have it now, came directly from God, word for word. He wants to claim that rabbinic exegesis is nothing other than a good uh, philological reading of the Bible. He wants to claim that Jewish law in the end remains binding and the Jewish tradition hasn't evolved in any serious way. So part of what you're getting at is actually, I think, and those are all points on which those later think thinkers will differ, I think aesthetics are another one of those issues. Mendelssohn doesn't, Mendelssohn thinks there are some good things about Christian services, but he actually thinks that there are many aspects of Christian worship that's potentially idolatrous. Um, people get up and look at words written on a wall. Um, there's something idolatrous about that for Mendelssohn. So I think um, what I'm sort of trying to get at here is that um, I think it's important for us to actually separate Mendelssohn from some of those later thinkers. His universalism, his rationalism sets the stage for them, but when it comes to determinate content, he actually disagrees strongly with them. I guess maybe we need to think about this question. Are, we, over, are we over valorizing Sarah Levy? If that's your question, basically. And my response might be that, um, you know, this really goes to how we write history and historiography and who we consider the major players to be when we talk about cultural history. And maybe what we're doing here, I learned so much this morning that I didn't know, maybe what we're doing is adding texture in a different perspective. Um, and it's not a question of, you know, are we turning things on, on their heads? but rather trying to paint a more complete picture of what the period really was. Terrific, yeah. Not terrific, no, let's get some coffee. Mm -hmm. Joel? Joel? I don't, I don't.